who will fill us in on all the fascinating things that we never knew about hibernation. He's Dr. Lauren Buck, professor of biology at UAA. He came to Alaska for the first time in 1986 as a commercial fisherman, but after the Exxon Valdez oil spill decided that he should try college as well and did fishing and college part-time at UAF and started doing his undergraduate work in hibernation physiology. And as he said, he didn't expect to go into academia, he just sort of kept going to school. He worked outside at a Midwestern medical school for some time after he graduated, and then moved back to UAF in 2000 to do research actually on stellar sea lions. But when he got the chance to come back to ground-based animals and come to UAA and work with ground squirrels again in 2007, he jumped at the chance and he's been here ever since. So he's primarily working on Arctic ground squirrels and please welcome Dr. Lauren Buck. Hey, I just want to make a quick announcement. Um, I am the one of the people on the committee that is trying to keep the science club going. Um, I need more volunteers. I need about four or five people. If anybody's interested, please come talk to me. We're going to stop for about three months and to try and find more uh, committee members. So, thanks. Hi. Pleasure to be here, and it's good to see so many people. I had no idea this was so popular. It's great. Um, I kind of uh, feel a little bit intimidated by preceding interstellar flight and um, after that song you know it's, it's, it's quite something to follow up on as well so as you've seen on the posters this is what I was supposed to talk about and that's what I thought I was going to prepare a, uh, a talk related to but midway through preparations um, my talk ended up more like this, random stuff about hibernation and my friend the Arctic ground squirrel. Um, there's just so much that I would like to share with you about hibernation and overwintering and all these adaptations, but 30 minutes isn't very long. So we're going to go on a whirlwind trip, hitting the high points of hibernation, and then we're going to move on into uh, some specifics of hibernation in the Arctic ground squirrel, and I threw in some black bear stuff too, just because it's kind of neat. So this is where we live. Um, this is a strange and wonderful planet, Earth. Um, it provides a huge diversity in habitats and in temperature and weather events. And it's this planet in which life on Earth evolved, us on Earth. And it's, uh, it's this place that we call home. And me, as an environmental physiologist, find it um, entirely fascinating to understand adaptations of animals to extreme and variable environments. We know that our planet has a, a lot of variation, and we know that there, it's characterized by lots of extremes. And so where did all this variation come from? Where did all these extremes come from? Initially, thank you, that's good. If we go back in time, since we've only got 30 minutes to go through this, we'll go back four and a half billion years ago and start with the, the hypothesis as to how our Earth really took the shape that it has today. Um, there's two basic hypotheses, but the upshot is the same from both of them. That about four and a half billion years ago, a Mars-sized asteroid came careening through space and smacked into our proto-Earth. At this time, the Earth was this kind of uh, semi-solid, semi-liquid, molten ball. And at, after this collision, all the stuff that sprayed out into space coalesced into what we know of now as our moon. Um, the moon is important to the cycling of the Earth and to also the patterns of seasonality that we see. Next slide. Um, in that the moon helps to keep the Earth in this uh, 23 and a half degree axial orientation, which results in our seasons. So it's the gravitational pull of the moon on the Earth that maintains that um, orientation that was initially started by this collision that occurred four and a half billion years ago. In addition, the moon gives us tidal rhythms that are so important to life on Earth today. Um, that axial rotation is what's responsible for the 
the very climates that we see across the Earth, coldest at the poles, warmer as you move to the equator. And this is a force that has shaped life tremendously. The combination of the changes in temperature and the changes in photo, photic input across the seasons is what really gives us then the changes in seasons and the changes in productivity. And these have been characteristic of Earth for a long, long time. We can go back to the age of the dinosaurs. We're going to fast forward to about 200 million years ago. At this time, this was the age of the dinosaurs. These guys ruled the Earth. But partway through the age of the dinosaurs, another creature came onto the scene. This is the first and the early proto-mammal. These guys were at, on the Earth at the same time as the dinosaurs ruled the Earth. And these aren't big guys. These are little tiny guys. They're about the size of a shrew, maybe a mouse and they're subterranean, they're cruising around underground, munching on insects, and afraid to show their face above the ground because the dinosaurs were a force to be reckoned with, and they were vulnerable to predation by dinosaurs. But then the scene changed considerably, another cosmic accident. Oh, back up one. Uh, no, next one, right here, thank you. Once again, a, a cosmic accident, we've got a comet comes careening through the atmosphere. It's six miles in diameter and smashes into what is now the Yucatan Peninsula. As it entered through our atmosphere, it was burning up and depositing ash that scattered around the globe. When it made its impact, it created a crater that is some 110 miles across that can be found today. Um, it pushed Earth into a winter because the sun's rays were blocked for so, many, so, so long and temperatures plummeted and thus went the end of the dinosaurs, but not our friend, the little mammal here. This mammal was buried underground, cruising around, eating insects, and had the capability of entering hibernation. So it was able to reduce its metabolic needs and it was protected to a considerable extent from the impact of this massive comet that struck the, the surface of the Earth. And it's this mammal, or this group of mammals, that eventually gave rise to all of us here today. This wasn't a rodent, it wasn't a primate. This is a mammal that's no longer amongst us, but we are looking back at our ancestor right here, this really small subterranean insectivore that is ancestral to all of us living today. Next slide. So the question is, what is hibernation? And I don't want to belabor this, but there's some terms that we that, that I just want to get clear so that we have an understanding of what is meant by hibernation. I hear the hibernation terminology misused all the time. Um, basically, what we're talking about is um, part of my slide is missing, but that's okay. Above these top two arrows, there should be text there um, saying something along the lines of body temperature regulation and metabolic regulation. We can break that into two general schemes. There are the ectotherms and the endotherms. The ectotherms are these lizards and snakes and frogs and toads, and their body temperature and metabolism closely tracks the environmental temperature. So if you have a frog, and you have your pet frog in the bathtub with you, its body temperature is in the, at the same temperature as your bath water, right? But then you get out of the bath, and you go into the kitchen, you make margarita, and you throw your frog in the margarita, the frog's temperature will mimic then the, the, the margarita temperature. Not true if it was a mouse, right? A mouse is an endotherm because that mouse can generate its own heat endogenously, and it doesn't matter so much what environmental temperature is doing, they're going to maintain a constant body temperature. So among our endotherms, that's where we're going to be focusing on, that's the red side here, there are heterotherms and homeotherms. You and I are, are homeotherms. We maintain a constant body temperature. It vacillates about 1.5 degrees per day. It drops a degree, degree and a half as you get ready to go to bed. And then it rises about a degree and a half before you get up in the morning. And that's your internal alarm clock telling you time to get up. Heterotherms, on the other hand, are very tolerant of regulated changes in metabolism and body temperature. So what these animals are able to do is dial back their core body temperature set point to something that might be hovering around ambient temperature. There's two different types of heterotherms. There are those that show daily torpor, so they'll go into this torpid state every night. 
they'll dial back their metabolism and their body temperature, and then they'll rewarm in the morning, or sometimes they'll do that during the day if they're not turned on. And then there are the hibernators, and it's the hibernators that we're talking about. So out of all these schemes here, we're talking about hibernators. They exhibit multi-day bouts of deep torpor. So they dial back their metabolic rate and core body temperature for days, weeks, months at a time, depending on what species we're talking about here. Okay. Ah, there it is. <laughs> okay, next slide. All right, um, so hibernation is really comprised of a couple of things. One is um, it's a behavioral adaptation and it's a physiological adaptation. So behaviorally, animals will sequester themselves and become quiet. Physiologically, they'll modify the body temperature set point and they'll, they'll dial back their metabolism. And it's characterized by these multi-day bouts. So it's not just a short period of time, it's a long period of time in which they do this. And we call that torpor. Next slide. Um, so in order for it to be hibernation, it's got to last at least 24 hours. So this is going to exclude those daily heterotherms that I was talking about earlier. Um, the animals have to be quiescent. So this excludes the polar bear, which we've heard go through walking hibernation. So even though they dial back their metabolic rate and their body temperature to a considerable amount, they are moving. They're walking from Alaska to Greenland at that time. Um, their body temperature must be roughly 30 degrees or less. Metabolic rate is profoundly reduced. 30 degrees Celsius, by the way. Um, animal can, and the animals must be able to spontaneously rewarm from torpor. So this isn't hypothermia. This isn't where you fall into a lake while you're ice fishing and your core body temperature drops and they pull you out and you've got a 20 degrees Celsius core body temperature and you survive. If they left you like that, your temperature would keep plummeting. You need exogenous heat to warm up. Hibernators can warm up on their own. And so it's not pathological, and it also excludes ectotherms. So you take your iguana, put it in an ice cube, it's, it's not going to be able to passively rewarm from that. Okay, uh, next slide. So something else is that hibernation is not simply an adaptation to the cold. So if we look at the distribution of hibernators across the globe, we find the majority of them are in the equatorial regions up to the low temperate zone. And as you go further north or further south from those regions, you end up with fewer and fewer and fewer hibernators. Um, early investigators used to think of hibernation as a failure of thermoregulation. So you've got your ground squirrel and it gets cold and the animal reduces its metabolic rate and stays in this, in this very, uh, in this torpid state. It used to be thought that, oh, they, they're just horrible thermoregulators. Not true at all. They're actually very exquisite thermoregulators and they put us to shame. And I'll show you some data that will support that. Next. So who are the hibernators? Well, there's a bunch of them. There's over 750 hibernators on, on the face of the earth today. Um, they occur on all continents except Antarctica, as we all learned just recently. Um, and they're represented in all major lineages of mammals. So these are the egg-laying mammals, the marsupials, and the eutherian mammals. And at least 11 different orders. So we consider hibernation an ancestral trait derived from this ancient mammal that is our progenitor. Next slide. So here is an example. I'm not going to go through all 750 species of hibernators tonight. So we're just going to, I'm just going to kind of hit the high points. This is a, an echidna from Australia and um, in Tasmania. They are egg-laying mammals, much like the uh, platypus, and they go torpid every winter and show hibernation patterns just like a ground squirrel will. Next slide. Um, this is a, a pygmy possum. It's a marsupial that's resident to Australia. Once again, a, a very strong hibernator seasonally. Next. Uh, hedgehog. All of the hedgehogs from Africa, Asia, and Europe are hibernators. Next. Um, these are a couple animals in my lab. Um, we've got a golden mantled ground squirrel on the left and an arctic ground squirrel on the right. So rodent hibernators. Very common adaptation in rodents. Next. Bats, many, many bats hibernate. Almost all of the bats hibernate, and there are hundreds of species of bats. Next. Um, this is a, a, a dwarf lemur from Madagascar, and it is a hibernator, and it is also a primate. So deep within our, our DNA is quite likely the ability to hibernate, because it is shown in other primates. Next. And, uh, I'm, I'm focusing on, on mammals today, but this is a bird that hibernates. 
This is the common poor will of North America, and they show hibernation bouts that look a lot like what a mammal will do, going torpid for many days at a time, and then rewarming and flying around, and then going back and going torpid again. Next. Yeah, I'm going to talk just briefly about a couple of hibernators, the Arctic ground squirrel, who is the superstar hibernator, the most, this is the Ferrari of the hibernating world. I mean, these guys are amazing. Um, this animal's name is Juicy. He lives up at, at Tulip, near Tulip Field Station on the North Slope. Next slide. Um, so some of the, the data I'm going to show you today is from uh, Tulip Field Station. It's located right here. It's about 800 miles north of here and well within the Arctic Circle. Next slide. Um, we go up there every spring in April or May. This was taken in May. To drive from Fairbanks or from Anchorage up the Hall Road, up over the Brooks Range at Tatulik Lake. Next. Um, we then spend our summer there and continue on into the fall trapping Arctic ground squirrels. So this is a graduate student, Robert Fredinger. He's packing traps across the tundra. Next slide. These traps are baited with carrot and squirrels love carrots. They become addicts and become quite trap happy. <laughs> so we have about 300 animals that we mark and, and, and monitor across the year using electronics. I've been doing this since 1992, so we're getting a really good picture of this extreme file. This, this mammal is living in an extreme habitat and also the habitat that's undergoing climate change more rapidly than any place else on the planet. Um, what we're looking for are markers of changes in physiology and adaptation that these animals are exhibiting in response to climate change. Next slide. So once the animals are trapped, we throw them in the back of the truck and they get a, a ride to my laboratory. Next. At Tulik Field Station. This is an NSF um, funded camp. And, uh, inside of here we have a surgery suite and various environmental rooms that we can work with. The animals are brought into the lab. Next. Oh, we missed a slide. Oh, back. Okay. We bring them into the lab, and this is a graduate student of mine, Melanie Richter, and she's implanting a temperature logger into the abdominal cavity of the animal. So these things are pre-programmed to measure and record body temperature each 15 minutes for about two years. And so from these body temperature records, we can learn so much about what the animals are doing. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but it tells us a whole bunch about the natural history. In addition, we outfit the animals with a collar that contains a light logger and a telemeter, so we can relocate individual animals anytime that we want them. And the light logger records when the animal is either above ground or below ground, so we get an idea of movement patterns within the above ground, below ground space. And then we monitor the environment in various ways. This is a soil temperature monitor that has a probe that goes into the burrow of the Arctic ground squirrel, into its hibernaculum, so we know the temperature at which they're hibernating below ground. Next. Once um, they're all outfitted with all the electronics, we bring them back out into the field, and they're happy to leave us for a year or so until we recapture those individuals again and recover the data from, from the animals. Next. So what I'm showing here are a couple things. One is the top is a cartoon of the annual cycle of an Arctic ground squirrel. And this is very typical of, of many um, obligate seasonal hibernators, um, other squirrel species that you find in North America and, and beyond. You can see it just grossly that there's a season of activity and there's a season of inactivity. And we're going to start with the active season. The active season begins in early spring, sometime in early April. Males first pop their head above ground. At that time, there's 100% snow cover. Ambient temperatures are about minus 30 or minus 40. Green up is two months away. These animals haven't eaten for over 200 days. So these males come up from a meter below ground, through sometimes a meter of snow, come to the surface and find this winter wonderland. Okay. Next slide. Females come to the surface the next week. And at this point, the males are charging around the tundra looking for love. They've got about a one-week breeding period. And so in this time, they're going from doorstep to doorstep, and they're fighting if there's a male there. Some things will fight to the death. And if there's a female there, well, they have a date. And I'll show you the, uh, the, the first date for an Arctic ground squirrel. Next. Oh, back up. Missing one. Right here. OK, so here is a series. We start at the top left, boy means girl, boy's big guy, the, the female smaller. 
male runs around, sniffs a little bit, moves the snow around, comes over, rubs against her flank a little bit in the far right top side, rubs on the other side, and then whoops, and they share a cigarette at the end of that. <laughs> so all of this took about 45 seconds. <laughs> so the male then will charge off to the next doorstep, think mailman here, go to the next doorstep and find out, is it a male there? If it's a male, you're going to fight. If it's a female, you're not going to fight. Okay, next slide. So the gestation period in Arctic ground squirrels is about 25 days, um, and they give birth these little pink things. They're about that big. And these little pink things will um, nurse from their mothers for about 30 days, staying below ground that whole time, and they emerge from their natal burrows, oh, right about summer solstice, 21st of June. And then from that period on, it's all about eating as much as you can because it starts snowing at Tulik in early August. And so they have to grow from being these little pink things to being a full-size squirrel with enough fat to hibernate and not eat for 200 to 270 days. So they've got just a short window of time. We figure that the maximum amount of time or they need at least 113 days to develop to hibernation size. So they're really pushing that envelope whether they can do it or not. Um, animals in midsummer will go from 5% body fat to 45, 50% body fat inside of three weeks. So you think Christmas is bad. Imagine <laughs> if you would put go from 5%, you know, like a lean athlete to really morbidly obese inside of three weeks. It's really amazing how fast they can fatten. Okay, next slide. Okay, so then they go into hibernation. So what does hibernation look like? And this is a trace from a, a free-living ground squirrel. That won't let me go over there. Okay, a body temperature trace. The solid line is core body temperature. And you can see that the animal body temperature is high between 35 and 40 degrees and it starts sloping down. As it's sloping down, that's when they went below ground, but they're not going into this torpid state yet. And then body temperatures plummets, goes into the basement for these windows of time where the animal's torpid. But you can see that they're not torpid continuously throughout hibernation. What they do is they go through these periodic arousals to high body temperature. Now the functional significance of that isn't known. We have a hypothesis out right now that we're testing. Um, the idea is that animals need to come to high body temperature to sleep. We always think of hibernation as, oh, the animal went to sleep for the winter. But in fact, they're not sleeping when they're torpid. Sleep is a physiological state that's very well characterized in terms of its, its neural um, excitation patterns. Once the animal's body temperature drops below 20 degrees, their brain goes isoelectric. They're brain dead. They don't get slow wave, fast wave sleep, and they go into this just really suspended animation type state. They rewarm for 12 hours after they've been torpid for 25 days. And during that 12 hours, they don't eat, they don't drink, they don't do anything. They just sit there and they sleep. Once they sleep through three cycles, they go right back down into torpor. So this pattern of periodic arousals to euthermy is characteristic of all species of hibernation that have been looked at, except for one. There's an animal that lives in Madagascar that does not go through these periodic arousals, but all the rest do. The other thing to notice in this is look at the body temperature that animal's going to. During midwinter, soil temperatures are down minus 25, minus 26 degrees Celsius. Their core body temperature is at minus 3. Minus 3 is well below the ice nucleation point of their tissues. Their tissues should be freezing, so, but they're not. They're in this metastable state called supercooled. So they could freeze. They don't have antifreeze proteins. But those liquids are not freezing, not because of freezing point depression due to the colligative effects or salt effects in the blood. Their blood freezes at minus 0.7. But they're spending 200 and some days in this metastable state where they should be frozen. Now, if you take an Arctic ground squirrel out of, the hiber out of its hibernation chamber and you're holding it in your hand, it's minus 3. It feels cold to the touch. And if you prick the pad of its foot with a pin, liquid blood comes to the surface. If you touch that blood with an ice nucleator, say an ice cube, just touch it, you'll get a freeze front that moves up the limb and will cross the body and kill the animal if you don't stop it, but you can stop that freeze front. So they are capable of freezing. As a matter of fact, we do have animals that do die in hibernation in captivity, 
The question is, did they die and then freeze, or did they freeze and then die? It's a difficult thing to sort out. We have a saying in the hibernation world that it's not dead unless it's warm and dead. So if you warm it up, you can't really tell if, an, if a hibernator is dead or not because they're taking one breath every five minutes. Their heart rate's going down to one or two beats a minute in deep torpor. So you have to warm them up to be sure if they're dead. Okay, this was big news in 1989 when Brian Barnes at the University of Alaska Fairbanks discovered that this is the only vertebrate that's known to go to, to become to go to that sustained body temperature and survive. So it's going to be the cover of Science Magazine. Next slide. So what, what do these data look like over the long term? So we catch these animals, and we download the data, and we put another data logger in those animals and let them go again. And over the lifetime of the animal, we can construct a thermal history for those animals. And I like this slide because you know, this is from a male Arctic ground squirrel. It was a juvenile in 2005. It was first implanted in August. And you can see for them what their world looks like. They're on the surface when it's 24 hours light across the summer, so they see the polar day. When the sun starts setting in August at Tulik, they say, forget it, I'm going into hibernation. And they go below ground, and they'll stay there for females 270 days, and they'll just go through these periodic arousals to euthermy. All of this period of time where their body temperature is low, they're not, they're not cognizant of anything. So to them, winter is 10 days. <laughs> and then they've got 120 days of summer, and they've got 10 days of winter, and they just oscillate back and forth between those two states. Next slide. So what about bears? This is something that comes up a lot. I hear people tell me that, well, bears aren't hibernators, or they're not true hibernators. And I, I take issue with that in that they do meet the criteria for hibernation. They do reduce their body temperature, they stop their activity, and they greatly reduce their metabolic rate across hibernation. So this is a picture of a bear at UAF. Um, we've been doing bear studies up there since 1992, when I first started graduate school up there, and go out and catch bears. So how do you catch a bear? Well, everybody's got an idea. I'll tell you how we did it. Um, we would go out in the summertime and dart them. And then we put a collar on them and let them go. And in the wintertime, we would go out again with a fixed wing aircraft and figure out where that bear was hibernating. And we'd fly around, fly around, and get a signal from the, the, the radio telemeter. And then we would land and make our way through the deep snow of the interior and find a little blowhole. These guys just kind of lay down on the ground, not in a cave, not in a hole. They just lay there and let the snow pile up over them. And they're breathing, albeit slow, their breathing is enough to maintain a little chimney through that snow. So the light's really flat in the interior in the wintertime. So you get down low and look across this, this landscape of snow, and you look for this little tower sticking up, and that's the chimney from their blowhole. And you work your way over there, you dig a hole in the snow, and if you're the graduate student, you crawl in the hole. <laughs> now, you're not sent in there with nothing, you are armed. You've got a jab stick with telazole in it. And you crawl in this hole, you've got a headlamp, and you look, and all of a sudden in the back of this den area, you see a black bear blinking its eyes at you, <laughs> and wagging its head back and forth slowly. And at that point, you jab, and your buddy feels you jab, and he pulls you out backwards. <laughs> bear goes to sleep, and then we load him on a helicopter, flying to UAF. And at UAF, we would implant them with all sorts of devices to, radio, to monitor body temperature, metabolic rate, brainwave, muscle tension, all of these things. So I'm not going to show you these data, but some of them came out just fairly recently. This is a 2011 science publication that came out of that study. Um, next slide. So once again, here's a cartoon, but this time bears, not squirrels. We can see the bears are going into hibernation sometime October, November. Brown bears are still up. I had a grizzly bear in my yard last night, so watch out. Um, but sometime October, November, we start seeing them go into hibernation. And they stay in hibernation until about April, 
they come above ground and that's when their breeding season is. You'll notice in this picture up around February that bear changes. That happened to be a female bear that was pregnant when she went into hibernation. And they give birth during hibernation and emerge from their hibernaculum with their, their little ones in tow. So these black bears when they're born are about this big. They're little tiny pink things that make their way on the belly of mom, find a nipple, latch on, and basically suckle until the end of hibernation. Females that are torpid and pregnant don't reduce their body temperature. Females that are non-pregnant will reduce their body temperature and torpor. Next slide. So here is a body temperature trace of a Fairbanks bear, actually a bear from Anchorage. Alaska Airlines now gives us the bears that we use on this study. But this black bear, um, you can see, is reducing its body temperature over the winter season, but that's a really minor drop. I mean, it's dropping from 38 degrees, what we are, down to maybe as low as 30. And this is one of the more extreme animals that drop down to 30 degrees. Most of them are dropping down to 32, 33 degrees. But even with this really small depression in body temperature, they're reducing their metabolic rate by 75%, such that they can survive a whole winter without eating. And in addition, they have lots of other adaptations for muscle sparing and their bone density that doesn't change over the winter. They've got all of these adaptations that are really of, of interest to us as physiologists that have a biomedical bent. Um, next slide. So let's just compare the body temperature of the Ferrari of hibernation, the Arctic ground squirrel, and the jalopy of hibernation, <laughs> the black bear. And you can see that the duration of the hibernation season varies considerably, but the, what's, what's most uh, relevant here is that the depth of torpor that is expressed is quite different. If you were so lucky to be so small that you could crawl into the burrow of a hibernating uh, Arctic ground squirrel, you could go in there with your telazole jab stick and it would not have any idea that you were there. As a matter of fact, you can take these guys, pick them up and juggle them. I bring them to grade schools and I don't juggle them. <laughs> we have animal care and use policy, so I don't juggle them. But I do bring them to grade schools and I'll give a whole hibernation talk with this guy, these things sitting in a box in front of me and then I hand them out and pass them around. The kids can then manipulate them because it takes them hours to rewarm. They're going from minus three to 38. They can't move until they're about 30 degrees. A black bear, as soon as that chopper lands or that fixed wing lands, they know you're there. And, and we've seen that where we've got them in captivity and they're all instrumented. You walk through the snow as you go to the bear den area. And when you get about 100 meters from that bear den, you can see their heart rate is increasing, their body temperature is increasing, they're getting ready for you to come visit them. And you, you, you guys that have lived up here in Alaska for a while, every couple of years you hear about a lineman putting something in and they're, they break through into a bear den and get mauled by a bear in the dead of winter. So their level of torpor, although it has huge um, energy savings, their level of torpor is much higher than is the level that we're seeing in the Arctic ground squirrel. Next slide. Okay, so I am thrilled by following these animals with these extreme adaptations. Doesn't matter what the adaptation is, but in this case, hibernation. But why else should we really care about hibernation in these obscure or seemingly obscure animal, animals? Well, they recently come to the forefront as a very relevant biomedical model for a number of disease and pathology, diseases and pathologies that people are experiencing. Firstly, um, cardiovascular disease. Hibernators are extremely resistant to reduced or even eliminated um, blood flow to the brain. You can take an Arctic ground squirrel, even when it's not in hibernation, and clamp blood flow to its brain for eight minutes. Restore blood flow. For you, we're talking about an animal that has a high metabolic rate you do this. That'd be like doing this to a human for over an hour. So you let the blood go back to the brain, they sit up, they grab a carrot, they eat it, they walk around, everything's fine. You do that with a rat for less than a minute, they're catatonic. They'll never recover from it. They have 80% necrosis in the brain. No brain cell death for a hibernator with client blood flow for out to eight minutes. Um, metabolic syndrome, so I told you these guys get really fat really fast. 
and they maintain this obese state. Even though they have this metabolic syndrome, they display none of the pathologies associated with metabolic syndrome. So you don't find arterial plaques, you don't find all these issues that people would deal with. Um, they are naturally tolerant to traumatic head injury. Um, this was kind of an accident, the way that it was, it was found out. Um, I won't go into a lot of details, but to try and understand how we function, we oftentimes want to know, well, how are, um, how are brain cells talking to one another? And the way, the way you do that is by using a technique called microdialysis. And you basically stick a small cannula, a tube, a straw, into the brain of an animal, you cement it into place, and you pump fluids in and pump fluids out. And you can find changes in neurotransmitter levels associated with various um, activities that the animal's involved in. And the animal can move about freely, everything's fine. And after looking at these data, um, a colleague of mine um, noticed that the brain sections later on, you couldn't find the traces of that cannula going in, whereas any other animal would have a up an area where there would be dead cells in there. These animals had zero cell death associated with it and resulted in a, a large scale grant funded by the military to understand natural tolerances to traumatic head injury, which is one of the most common injuries in the military right now. Um, probably the National Football League would be interested in this as well. As well. I have to keep that in mind. They've got deep pockets. Um, diabetes. Um, they seasonally become insulin resistant, but they don't have any pathologies. Um, circadian disorders, Arctic ground squirrels are uh, active in the Arctic across the polar day. You don't have any sunrise or sunset set, set episode to entrain their circadian clocks, yet they remain rhythmic. They wake up at 6.59 in the morning and they go to bed at 6.59 at night. It doesn't matter what the weather's doing, what anything's happening, they keep track of that. I go up to Tulip in the summertime, and my clock starts to free run. I go to bed 11 o'clock the first night, 12 o'clock the next night, 1 o'clock the next night, and you get on village time. You know? So how is it that they're able to maintain persistent rhythms despite living in an environment that is functionally arrhythmic with respect to photo cues? Next. So, NASA's always been a big supporter of, uh, of the hibernation research because right now we can build rockets that can go to Mars, we can go beyond Mars, but our limitation is our biology. I was on a committee with this last year that went to Washington, D.C. to study stress in the healthy animal. And what we're trying to do is figure out what we can do about human physiology that will enable protracted space, uh, space travel. So right now, we are committed to putting a man on Mars. And we're committed to doing that in the next 20 years. So to go from Earth to Mars and back, without even landing on Mars, this is a boomerang flight. You just go out, do one orbit around, and come back to Earth, it takes 18 months. And I can tell you, astronauts fall apart in far shorter time than that. Um, the, the oddities that you might, uh, the odd physiologies that, that, that occur in space just would blow you away um, in terms of the, the, how uh, pervasive they are and how debilitating they are. So they're looking at the hibernator as a model. You know, think about how much oxygen you have to pack along, how much food you have to pack along. But if you can go into this um, quiescent state, reduce your metabolic rate, by 99%, that means that you could travel for 99 days on what it would take you to fuel your body for one day. So it really stretches out our possibilities. And the list goes on and on. There, there's a whole lot of things that we can, we can learn from from these hibernators. Next slide. So questions and then funding. Next slide. <laughs> So all of this stuff doesn't come cheap, and we are forever grateful to the various funding entities that are out there that have really richly supported our research programs um, in, in the hibernation world. So thank you very much.
So I think, I've never been to one of these things before, so I think right now we open it up for questions, or I don't have to sing or anything. No, no. <laughs> you have to go into hibernation. Okay. Yeah, so I'm happy to answer questions, or try to answer questions, should you have them. Oh, yes. Hi, uh, we're from the Kentucky area, I just moved here, but some researchers are doing research on bears down in Tennessee, hibernating, stuff like that. Do you know if there, there are hibernation patterns, is any different in the warmer area compared to here in Alaska? Yeah, yeah, I can comment just briefly on that. Um, so the question is, um, hibernators at lower latitudes, do they show similar patterns as they do in Alaska? Yeah, um, basically what, what we see is that there's a fairly hardwired rhythm among bears in terms of their hibernation, at least among the black bears. That uh, The data that I'm more familiar with is out of Virginia. And they show almost the same hibernation pattern as what you find from bears in Fairbanks. They're also different. They don't seem to go under the snow and get buried like here. They, they do tend to go under tree roots in little hollows. Yeah, that, that's probably more uniquely Alpine and Alaskan, where that you have a persistent snowpack rather than having to look for caves for shelter or protection. Um, you know, brown bears are also good hibernators. Interestingly, though, the bigger the brown bear is, the less that it hibernates. So I've been on Kodiak for a number of years, and the biggest bears that you find there will walk around all winter long. They act more like a polar bear, so they go into this walking hibernation state, and they will never go torpid because there isn't much advantage to them going torpid when you're that when you're that size. Got a question? Go ahead. I'm a little confused. Uh, Me too. <laughs> I think of uh, underground storage areas and things like that, uh, especially if native, native residents. And I'm confused about how far do you have to go down in places where it's like 30 below and to get the temperature to even out. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking there's squirrels. I mean, they're they're many degrees below um, below zero their body temperature, but they're underground. How far underground do they go? Do you yeah, so how, how deep do you have to go in the, what, what, what's the soil temperature profile of where Arctic ground squirrels are hibernating? So if you look at average permafrost depth across the Arctic, it's about 15 centimeters. But if you look at average depth of a hibernaculum, it's 100 centimeters. So they're finding sites where the permafrost is deeper than average. They don't just randomly set up their, their hibernacula out there. Because you're, if you're only at 15 centimeters, when air temperature drops to minus 60, the soil temperature at minus 15 centimeters is going to be minus 40, minus 50. But the deeper you go, the closer you get to the permafrost, ironically, the warmer it gets in the winter. So it provides a thermal buffer for them but it is still colder than they can drop their body temperature. Did I answer your question? Close. Yeah. Close. <laughs> <laughs> How about being able to control them to go into hibernation? So the question is, can you control an animal to actually make them go into hibernation? Um, there are hibernators out there that are facultative hibernators, and all you've got to do is remove food and stick them in the cold, and they'll go into hibernation. An example of that would be a primate hibernator in Madagascar. They don't respond to seasonal rhythms. It's not an endogenous clock within them that's telling them when it's time to go into hibernation. They respond to El Nino and La Nina events. So once the, the leaves start drying up on the trees and the food goes away, they find a handy dandy stump and they crawl in it and they might sit there for 18 months hibernating. And then all of a sudden the weather pattern shifts and they can come out and take advantage of everything when it's lush. Now the ground squirrels, the Ferraris as I mentioned, these guys are highly programmed in their annual cycle. You can take an Arctic ground squirrel from the North Slope bring it into the laboratory, put it under a constant 12-12 photo period at room temperature, 
and constant food, and that animal is still going to go into hibernation, go through reproductive maturation nine months later, and go through pre-hibernation fattening. It's going to go through all of these stages, but at 20 degrees. And so it is built into their architecture, into their, it's, it's part of their annual clock. Now, in captivity, it's, the clock isn't perfect. That rhythm free runs. It's on an 11-month period. So every year, it shifts by a month. So I have hibernators in the lab. And they come in each year. And so I've got multiple years represented in the lab. So I have animals going into hibernation in December, in February, in March, in July, because they're different cohorts that came to the lab. Them persists. Yeah, there's a lot of things. I, I'm very aware with, uh, of Kelly's work. I've, I've worked with her quite a bit. Um, and there's a lot of things that can um, induce an animal to come out of hibernation. And there are even some drugs now that have been shown to induce a hibernation-like state pharmacologically, but it is still very distinct from hibernation. Maybe I missed this, but what was it that stopped the blood freezing in the brown squirrels? So you were taught that water freezes at zero Celsius, right? I was too. And it mostly freezes at zero. Um, the freezing point is actually a statistical probability. If you go out, and I've done this with my classes, gone out and measured water temperature of various puddles right about this time of year, you'll find that some puddles are at minus five, some puddles are at minus three, sometimes you'll find a puddle at minus eight and it doesn't necessarily freeze. It tends to freeze at that temperature. It melts at zero, but the freezing point is a statistical probability. So um, you can take pure water in a test tube, and you can cool it down slowly, easily in the lab, down to minus 15, minus 16, and it'll stay liquid. If you provide a nucleator, or you whack the side of that test tube with a pencil, it'll freeze immediately. So they are walking this metastable state in hibernation, where they're below the ice nucleation point of their tissues, relying upon statistical probabilities that they're not going to freeze. So they're super cool. They don't have, they do not have antifreeze proteins like what you find in the Antarctic ice fishes and in, in some insects and things like that, these cryoprotectants. They're not there, we've looked. Yes? Mentioned was how um, with these ground squirrels, every 25 days they've got to bring their temperature up so they can go through the sleep cycle. So, is the are the is the brain activity during that sleep cycle? Does that look the same as brain activity during when they're not in hibernation, coming up to a sleep cycle? And what uh, if anything does that say about the whole function of sleep? And, you know, there's some kind of question. Oh like yeah, there's. <laughs> so this question relates to um, the architecture of sleep during an arousal episode as compared to a period of time when the animal is euthermic or at high body temperature in the non-hibernating season. Um, when an animal during torpor goes through an arousal episode and initiates sleep for that 12 hour period, that sleep architecture is identical to what you find after the animal has been active on the surface in the summer for 12 hours and then goes below ground for 12 hours of sleep. So it appears as though the sleep debt that accrues over a 25 day period of torpor is the same as what accrues over 12 hours of normal body temperature in the summertime. So biochemical reactions slow down when it's colder and, and we know that the, the sleep clock is an hourglass type of a clock. It's not an oscillator like a circadian clock, so it builds up slowly over time. Well, if its rate of buildup is not temperature compensated, it would make sense that it would take it much longer at minus three to build sufficient sleep debt to induce sleep than it would at 38 degrees. But yeah, it looks identical where you have the same slow wave, fast wave, same amplitude, same delta power, all of that comes out equivalent as a night's sleep in the summer when the animals are torpid in the winter or aroused from torpor in the winter. So what about 
about drinking and urination, and why don't they go into kidney failure? So the animals don't eat, eat or drink during torpor, and why don't they go into kidney failure? Well, we know that when you metabolize fat, and much of the hibernation season is fueled by fat, that there's a tremendous amount of metabolic water that is liberated from that. So we have evidence from the lab that the animals occasionally will urinate, rarely if ever will defecate because they enter hibernation with an empty gut. So I, I think that they are building up liquid in their body, and we know that they also burn a fair amount of lean tissue, and you have to be able to get rid of these nitrogenous wastes in water if, um, or you would go to, to kidney failure. So the urination does exist, and the source of water is metabolic water. Yes? Okay. Um, the question is, why is it that large animals don't have the same benefit metabolically as do small animals? And this relates to um, this relationship between metabolic rate and body size. So. The smaller an animal is, the higher its gram-specific metabolic rate is. So a shrew, on a per gram basis, has a metabolic rate that is many-fold higher than an elephant on a per gram body size, okay? So if you follow that curve all the way down, the metabolic rate of a blue whale that's swimming around is the same as its metabolic rate would be if, as if it was torpid. So there is no metabolic savings. So the bigger you are, the less you can save. Does that make sense? Because of this relationship between body mass and metabolic rate. Question? That is a great question. So animals in hibernation, how do they know when it's time? We don't know the answer to that question. They don't appear to be responsive to um, exogenous cues. It's not soil warming. It's not that the earth shakes or that they've got an alarm clock in their burrow. They've got, and we don't know how it works, but they've got a clock, likely in their brain, much like the circadian clock, that is telling them when these events in their life are to occur. And they are incredibly precise. I've, I've had animals that ended hibernation on the same day, year after year after year, independent of what the environmental conditions above were doing. One year it was minus 40, the next year it's plus 20. That animal ended hibernation on April 9th. So that's a project that we are submitting as a proposal this January. Is It's really a quest to try and find the circanial clock. Was the hibernation or torpor affect longevity? So the question is, does hibernation or torpor affect longevity? There's good evidence that it does. A lot of the reason in which we, the reason for us aging is due to oxidative damage. And if you're able to dial back your metabolic rate by over 90% for six, seven months out of the year, you're reducing oxidative damage. And so there, there are certain species where this is really, um, it, it appears evident. Um, the little brown bats, they have the same mass as two quarters in your hand. They are tiny, tiny little critters. And they've got a heart rate when they're flying around of over one hertz. And so they are just a metabolic machine, but they go into torpor every night and they hibernate every winter. So they, they, they really then back off that oxidative stress and they live to be at least 40 years in the wild. So you would expect an animal of that size to have a six month lifespan. One more over here. Um, I just, have, have you seen climatic changes? How is that affecting since 
the rhythm is always the same, but the external environment is changing. So. Yeah, so the question is, with the studies we've been doing, are we finding a phenotypic or organismal response to climate change in this species? Um, are there survival, even their survival rate? And, um, okay, that's a tough one. We're doing this, <laughs> but it's a, it's a tough question. What, we're, what we've found is that these guys are very hardwired in their timing. And climate change in the Arctic doesn't just mean that it's getting warmer. And what matter is it, really, that it gets two degrees warmer? If it's minus 38 or, or if it's minus 40, it's cold, right? Even though minus 38 isn't quite as cold. The biggest problem with climate change in the Arctic, in Arctic Alaska in particular, is that there's increased snowfall. So with increased snowfall, it makes it the snow persists later in the year. So you think of climate warming as having earlier spring. Not true. In, in the Arctic, what it means is spring-like conditions are coming later and later. They're coming three weeks later than they were 10 years ago. And if you look back at our oldest climate records for this region, there were no late season snow events before 1995 in the Tulip area. So a late season snow event is over 10 inches after the 1st of May. 1995, we had our first. And since then, we've had more each year, sometimes 10 or 12 late season snow events. It was snowing on the 18th of June last year up there, and snow had not melted. And so that makes it so these animals haven't eaten for so long, have committed themselves to reproduction, now have no food. And what we found is we've had an 80% reduction in the number of Arctic ground squirrels at one of our sites just from one of those years. So what this can serve, though, as is a, a selection point because not all of the animals come up on the same day. There's still some variance. And so all of the earliest animals to come to high body temperature died. All of them. Only those that came up later survived and their genome is going to be more represented in the years to come. So we might be seeing evidence of microevolution um, in this population. Over where? Oh, okay, behind the pole. Uh, so as I understand it, um, some, some uh, of us are just naturally hibernators, some animal species, and some are not naturally hibernators. When you talk about going to Mars and the mission to Mars with humans, are there examples of critters that you can, one can induce hibernation in if they're not naturally hibernators? Has that been done in other species, or has that been done in humans? Um, there's been a lot of work in trying to understand um, the effects of different pharmacological agents to induce a torpor-like state. and. There's been modest successes in those. Um, there's a whole other group of researchers that have looked and said, okay, this is ancestral, so within our genome, we should be able to unlock the secret to how animals that are hibernators turn on this genetic signature within their genome. And so where research has gone has been either developing drugs that can reduce metabolism at body temperature set point, or in investigating hibernators like the black bear, like the Arctic ground squirrel, and trying to figure out what genes are turned on and off or up or down regulated that enable expression of the hibernation phenotype. So, no, there's no example out there of an animal that was not known to be a hibernator that can show or be induced to hibernate at this point. But I don't think it's too far out there in the future. In the back? Um, does the hair lake cycle go on up at two and lake two? Um, no, there aren't any links. And the hairs don't extend over the Brooks Range in any real numbers. So that is a question on predator-prey relationships, the classic hair and lynx relationship. How do you know that that first mammal was a hibernator? Well, one reason that we think that the first mammal was probably a hibernator is that it survived the thing that wiped everything else out. Um, that hibernators occur widespread <laughs> across a spatial arena on virtually every continent. Um, 
And that if we look at our most basal mammals, these would be the Tenrex from Madagascar, the most ancient mammal, they're crazy, they've got a cloaca. Um, the, the females have 38 nipples and give birth to 38. They, they, they walk around with body temperature of 28 degrees. So these are our most basal extant mammals, basal living mammals today, and they are hibernators all of them. So it's, it's a lot of conjecture, but it's, it's agreed upon. There's, I don't think anybody out there that would say that it's, a, it's an, an entirely derived trait. So we say that ancestrally, mammals were hibernators, but then we have some mammals that have really pushed that to an extreme, like the Arctic ground squirrel, and have, be, have a very derived form of this ancestral phenotype. So they've made it better. They started with the ability, and then through forces in the environment, um, uh, all that shaping, they've become the most supreme hybrid. Okay, we're Thank you so much to Dr. Lauren Beck. And thank you everybody for coming. Um, before you go, I'd just like a quick show of hands. How many of you are here because of the meetup group? Cool, thank you very much. Thank you again to the Taproot for hosting this. Thank you to the Science Club community. And don't forget to come back next month on the 14th of December. We'll see you then when we talk about Icarus Interstellar. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great evening.